So as recording starts soon. Oh, I'm recording now. All right. So um, we're going to go through Riemann sums. And this PowerPoint was modified for Mr. Jansen's just as an FYI. Um, when we're talking about Riemann sums, basically we're trying to figure out how can we do the area underneath a curve if it's not going to make a triangle or a rectangle or a trapezoid or a circle. So how do we do just a random curve? And we talked about in the video how to go from integral not notation to sigma notation. And basically that's the idea of Riemann sums is that instead of having infinitely many different rectangles, we're going to draw the rectangles different ways. Um, so they're called Riemann sums because they're named after Mr. Riemann. Um, and this is from Mr. Jansen's slides. And then he talks about Riemann sons, um, but we're not actually talking about his sons. We're talking about Riemann sums. So anyway, we're talking about different ways to find the area underneath an actual curve. So if it's actually a, a crazy curve, or in this case, a quadratic curve, um, and the example that we're going to do, we want to find the distance traveled if we're measuring X in hours and Y is our velocity in miles per hour. So this is my velocity and this is my time. And if you find the area underneath the velocity time graph, this area is going to be the distance. And so just as like a little side note, we talked before about how you can go from position and take the derivative and get to velocity and take the derivative again and get to acceleration. So when you take the derivatives, you go down a level. So if I wanna go up a level, if I wanna go from the velocity to the distance or from the velocity to the position, I would use the integral. So we're gonna just do this problem over and over and over again today. We're gonna to try to figure out what's the area underneath the curve, negative one fifth X squared plus five between zero and five. Now it kind of looks like it's a quarter circle or something like that or a triangle, but it's not. It's part of a quadratic curve. So there's no geometric shape that will give us this area. So what we're gonna talk about today is what are different ways that we can approximate it? So how can we get close to the right area? And we're gonna look at four different Riemann sums. We're gonna look at like the left endpoint method, the right endpoint method, the midpoint method, which are all just different ways of drawing rectangles. And then the trapezoid method, which as the name implies is going to use trapezoids, not rectangles. So most of them are just different ways to draw rectangles. It's just a matter of which side are we using. Um, and then the last way is a trapezoid method. Now, hopefully you guys were able to print this worksheet up because then you can just fill it in as we go. And I already filled in like half of it for you because I didn't want you guys to be typing things in over and over and over again. All right, so the left endpoint method, or LRAM, which stands for left rectangle approximation method, the main thing to keep in mind is the L. The L stands for the left. So we're gonna take the integral from zero to five and split it up into five subintervals. And the problem will tell you how many subintervals to use. So however many intervals you have, that's how many rectangles you're gonna draw. So basically we're saying, we're gonna figure out this area by drawing five rectangles. And we're always gonna use the left endpoint to draw the rectangle. And I'll show you what I'm talking about in a second. Now, for a rectangle, we know that the area is just length times width or base times height. So when we talk about base here, we're talking about the width or the base of this rectangle. And you can find out the width or the base of the rectangle by just doing B minus A divided by the number of rectangles. And that's the same formula that you use in sigma notation. It's just there's not infinitely many. In this case, there's only five. So that's what my N value is. So in this case, I would be doing five minus zero divided by five. Five minus zero is five. Five divided by five is one. So if I have five intervals and I'm going from zero to five, the width of each rectangle or what I'm calling in this example, the base is one. And as soon as I say stuff that doesn't make sense, like stop me, like that's the purpose of live teaching. So you guys can ask questions. So each of these rows is going to correspond to one of these rectangles that's drawn in the picture. So for each of them, I need to know what the base is and what the height is. 
the height is going to come from this f of x row. And then the area is just going to be the base times the height, or the base times f of x. And we're just going to get different f of x values depending on what our x value is. Since I'm on the left side, for the interval going from 0 to 1, I want to use the x value that's on the left side, so 0. And then for the interval between 1 and 2, I'm going to use 1. And then the interval between 2 and 3, I'm going to use 2. And the interval between 3 and 4, I'm going to use 3. And the interval between 4 and 5, I'm going to use 4. I'm never going to use this point because it is on the left of something going out this way that I can't see. And we don't need anything beyond 5. Now to figure out f of x, like if you were doing it by hand, you would plug in 0 and figure out what that equation is. Negative 1 fifth times 0 squared plus 5 is 5. And then negative 1 fifth times 1 squared plus 5, and you can get your answer. I think it's going to be 4.8. Let me double check before I tell you guys incorrectly. Yeah, 4.8. Now, I'm going to show you guys how to do it in your calculator real quick because I don't want you guys to have to punch these buttons over and over and over again. So if you have a TI-84, I'm going to show you how to do it there. Otherwise, just use Desmos. So on your TI-84, uh, clear out your calculator and then go to Y equals. So in Y equals, you're going to type in the equation that you're dealing with. So go to Y equals, type in negative one-fifth x squared plus five. And then we're going to go back to the main screen and we can just figure out one value at a time. In theory, you could go to the table and you could set it up however you want. But I think it's easier if you just go back to the main screen. And then on the main screen, if you hit bears to bring up your variables and then go over to y variables, and then just hit enter twice, and it's going to bring up y1. And so you're going to say, like, y1 of 0. So that would give you the answer if you plug in 0. And then we need to plug in 1 next. So I'm going to go back up there. This time I'm going to plug in 1. And then I need to plug in 2. And so on. So I need to plug in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. I don't need to plug in 5 on this example. But this is how you can get your calculator to do it for you quickly. So either use your calculator or use Desmos. I don't want you guys doing all this by hand because it's tedious as it is with a calculator. It would be even more tedious if you were doing it by hand. So the calculator is going to give me these values, 4.2, 3.2, 1.8. And then again, to find the area of each rectangle, I just do the base times the height. So since I'm multiplying by 1, none of these are really going to change. And then we just add up these five numbers, and we'd end up with 19.0. Now, if I look at my picture, each of these rectangles is including something that's not part of the curve that I'm trying to calculate. Like this little piece up here, this little piece up here, this little piece up here, this little piece up here. So then when it asks, is this an over or an under estimate? Like we can just look at the picture that we have drawn. And since our rectangles are all bigger than the curve, this is an over estimate. Now don't memorize that left is always an over estimate because that's not always true. If it's decreasing, then that'll be true. But if it was increasing and we drew rectangles on the left side, they're gonna be under the curve. And we'll see more examples of that later on. But for now, this is an overestimate because each of these rectangles is getting more area than is actually underneath the curve. All right, so questions on that first one. All right. So for the next example, we're still doing a left endpoint method. We're still going from zero to five. The only difference is now we have six subintervals. So for my base, the width of each of these, it's not going to be one anymore because you can't fit six intervals that are each one in between zero and five. So to figure out what this number is, again, I'm just going to do B minus A divided by N. So five minus zero divided by six, which would be five, six. 
So each of these rectangles has a length, or sorry, I guess a width of five, six. So I can go ahead and fill in that five, six going the whole way down. Now we're still using a left endpoint method. So the first X value that I'd want to use is still zero. So the first F of X value is still five. But when I get the area, I'm not doing five times one this time. I'm doing five times five six. So my area is going to be like 4.1667. The next X value that I want to use is not one because I'm not all the way over at one yet. I'm here at five, six. So that's the next X value that I need to use. And then I'd move over five, six more after that. And I would be up to 10, six. So the X value that I'm going to use is moving over by this amount each time. So take maybe two minutes and try to fill the rest of this table in. So figure out what the X values are, and then use your calculator to plug in each of those X values. And then for the area, you're doing the base times F of X. And again, we can see from the picture, since this is a decreasing function, each of these rectangles is above the curve. So if you're using a left Riemann sum and you have a decreasing function, we're gonna be overestimating because we're gonna be drawing a rectangle that goes above the curve. All right, so you guys can go ahead and just check your answers. Um, most of you guys were probably still working, and that's fine. As long as you got the ones correct that you did, then you're all good. So don't worry about getting every single one done as long as the ones that you did are correct. Now, our number went down slightly, but these rectangles are being drawn from the left side, so they're still going above my curve. So these are still going to be an overestimate. It's going to be a little bit closer to the right answer. 18.634 miles will be closer than 19.0 miles, but it's still going to be an overestimate. All right. If you're following along so far, hit the little raise hand button. Okay, looks like at least half of us are. All right, now I did not want you guys to just have to punch buttons in your calculator all day every day and then just copy them down. So most of the rest of this worksheet is filled out for you. But like, don't just start zoning out, like make sure you understand where the numbers came from. I'm just not making you write every single thing down. So the next, the next example is a right endpoint method. We're going back to doing five intervals. So going between zero and five, five intervals, our base is back to being one again, because we do five minus zero divided by five. The difference is for this first interval going between zero and one, I don't use zero. I don't care about the left side. I care about the right side. So on the right side of zero and one, the first X value is one. And then F of 1 was 4.8. And so this first area is 4.8. So everything's the same, except I'm using the point that's on the right side to draw the rectangle instead of the point that's on the left side. And I'm even drawing a rectangle over here at 0. Like it doesn't show up in the picture because there's not really anything there. But I use this point at zero. So when x is five, f of x is zero. So that rectangle is zero. Now think to yourself, is this going to give me an overestimate 
or an underestimate. And hopefully in your brain, you said under. Because if you can look at the picture, all these little white gaps here are not being accounted for by my rectangles. So we're going to end up with an underestimate. And if you add them all up, you'd get 14. So back on the first left sum we did, we got 19 miles. The first right sum we did, we got 14 miles. We said that 14 was an underestimate and 19 is an overestimate. So we don't know exactly what the right answer is at this point, but we know for sure that it's between 14 and 19. And we'll get more accurate using different methods, but we can get an idea of where we're like, where our answer should be based on where we're at so far. Questions on the right endpoint method. And again, like the table was filled out for you. So all you guys had to do was understand why we used one, two, three, four, five, instead of zero, one, two, three, four. All right, now on the midpoint method, we're still doing rectangles. And the most important thing to remember, so you need to write this in your notes or write it on the worksheet somewhere, is that we are doing the midpoint of the X's. So we're looking at the midpoint of the X's. So take your two X values and pick the X that's halfway in between them. You don't want to take your two Y values and average those. That's what the trapezoid method does. The midpoint method, you want to take the midpoints of the X's. So we're going to do the midpoint method with five intervals. The base is still one because the width of all those rectangles is still one. But I don't use zero or one. I use the point that's halfway in between zero and one. And then I don't use one or two. I use the point that's halfway in between one and two. I don't use two and three, I use the point that's halfway in between. So the X values that I use for this one are 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, and 4.5. And then you find F of X the same way as before. So you plug in your function and then let your calculator do the work. So this would be 4.95 and then multiplying by one. Now, on the midpoint, it asks if it's an over or an underestimate. I would circle the question mark. This was kind of like a mistake on the worksheet. The midpoint method, you don't know. Like, the midpoint method is not going to be clearly an overestimate or clearly an underestimate. And if you look at it, like we're overestimating a little bit and underestimating a little bit on each one. And you won't be able to tell like which of those areas is greater or lower just by looking at the graph. So I don't know. When you have a midpoint, you're not going to be able to tell if it's an over or an underestimate. For this particular example, it ends up being a slight overestimate, but you can't tell that just by looking at it. So the most important thing about the midpoint, and if you didn't write it down a minute ago when I said it, write it down now is that we are doing the midpoint of the X's. So you find the X that's halfway in between and then find the Y value based on that. You don't average the two Y's. So you don't find the two Y's and then average them. You find the two X's, average them, and then find the Y value that corresponds to that. All right. The last method is not a rectangle. It's a trapezoid. Now, really what we're doing, so if you think back to like elementary school, when you learned about trapezoids, they looked like this. And you had a base on the top and a base on the bottom, and then you had a height. In calculus, most of the time when you see a trapezoid, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna be flipped on its side, where you have the bases on the side and the height is going in between the two bases. Now, this picture, it's kind of hard to see, but basically we're taking the left endpoint and the right endpoint and we're connecting them and then using that to make a trapezoid instead of making a rectangle. So when we find the trapezoid, we're gonna need the left and the right endpoint and then together we use those to make a trapezoid instead of a rectangle. So this base is really the height of the trapezoid. Now, if we're doing five subintervals, 
that base is still going to be one because the width of each or the height of each trapezoid is still going to be one. Now, in my table, I don't know if your table says X and X or if it does say X1 and X2, but I would make it X1 and X2. And then B1 is really just what is the height that went with X1. So B1 is really just F of X1 and B2 is really just F of X2. So to fill out this first row, the first trapezoid is going from zero to one. So one X value is zero, the other X value is one. And then I can plug it in to get these values. So five and 4.8. I'll get the area in a second. So then for the next, so the next trapezoid is going from one to two. So we're looking at this one right now. So X is one to X is two. We already know this value. And then if I plug in two, we get 4.2. And when you're filling out the trapezoid table, you should notice that like this value is the same. And then this value is the same. And then this value is gonna be the same as that value. And this value is gonna be the same as that value because each side gets used in two different trapezoids. They get used in the trapezoid on the left and the trapezoid on the right. The endpoints are the only ones that are not gonna show up twice, like this five and this zero down here. Now, when you find the area, you can't just do length times width because it's not a triangle, it's a trapezoid. So you're gonna have to do one half times the height, which is really called the base here, and then times B1 plus B2. So when you do that for each of them, it's gonna give you the area. Now, it's kind of hard to see here. I was writing on top of it, but some problems will ask you to find the left sum and then ask you to find the right sum and then ask you to find the trapezoid sum. If you've already found the left sum and the right sum, the trapezoid is just those two added together and divided by two because you're basically just taking all the ones on the left and then all the ones on the right and you're dividing it by two because that's part of the trapezoid formula. I wouldn't memorize this formula except that it'll help you on some of the math excels. Like the only time this is useful is if you've already figured out the left sum and the right sum. So if you've already figured out the left and right sum and you want to know the trapezoid sum, then you just average them. Now, on the AP exam, it's a very common thing to ask you if you did an overestimate or an underestimate. And it's gonna be based on whether your function is increasing or decreasing. And I got a little ahead of myself. So before we get that, um, if you hit math nine on your calculator and type this in, we can see very close to what the answer actually should be. So, Throughout the course of class today, some of our answers were as big as 19. Some of them were as low as 14. We were approaching the right answer. And when we look at like the trapezoid method, 16.5 is pretty close to the right answer. And the midpoint method, 16.75 is pretty close to the right answer. So even with just five subintervals, we were able to get very close to the right answer. Now what your calculator is gonna do is the same idea. It probably does the trapezoid method with like 10,000 intervals or something like that. So that's how your calculator works. Okay. Um, now, if you want to copy this into your notes later, you can. I'm recording this so you can watch it later and record it. But I recommend that you learn how to draw the pictures and come up with a conclusion rather than trying to memorize everything. So, for example, if a function is concave up and increasing, if I wanna know if the right or the left or the trapezoid is an over or under estimate, I would just draw something that is concave up and increasing. Or if I wanted to know concave up and decreasing, bye Maddie. If it was concave up and decreasing, it would look something like this. And then I'd say, okay, if I draw the rectangles from the left side, they're overestimates. And if I drew them from the right side, they'd be underestimates. So I don't recommend that you memorize these rules. I, me I recommend that you learn how to draw the pictures and then come up with a conclusion. And we'll come back to this second semester. 
Um, here's the other summary. So basically, if you're doing a left sum, you want to look at like for left or right, you want to look at whether it's increasing or decreasing. And that'll tell you whether you're an over or an underestimate. For a trapezoid sum, you want to look at whether it's concave up or concave down. Because the trapezoids, it matters the concavity because you'll either draw a trapezoid that's above or a trapezoid that's below. For the left and right sums, it just matters whether the original function is increasing or decreasing. It doesn't matter whether it's concave up or concave down. The left or right sum is still going to match. So again, you can try to memorize this. I don't recommend that. I recommend that you just draw a function that's increasing and then think about, okay, if I'm increasing and I draw from the left side, I'm going to be underestimating. Or if I'm increasing and I draw from the right side, I'm going to be overestimating. All right, questions? Okay, so the last thing is the last example that you guys have on your worksheet. So the same example, you've already got the equation in your calculator. We wanna find the Riemann sum using the midpoint method and using eight intervals. So chop up zero to five into eight rectangles and figure out the area for each of those. I'm going to let you guys work on this for a second. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs> 